the grid, a digital frontier. I pictured patriots as they moved throughout our country. Do they look like individuals or small business? Were the rallies like church? I keep dreaming of a world I hope to one day see. And then, today, I got in. Hello, fellow Americans. This is Chris Coleman, your host with the Kingdom Patriot Group. Welcome to The Grid, where faith, politics, and commerce intersect. The time for violence is now. That and more today on The Grid. Forever 17 is a company that creates beauty elixirs and was co-founded by entrepreneurs Martha and Tammy. Years ago, Martha began a quest to learn how to heal her body naturally. Upon discovering plant-based essential oils and being an amazing culinary artist, she began experimenting with all sorts of unique creations in her kitchen. Facial serums, body butters, balms. With a newfound resolve to walk away from products with ingredients she couldn't pronounce, she embarked on a journey to create wonderful natural elixirs and products that help the skin and began sharing that with family and friends. Get these products today at forever17.net and see all the products that Martha and Tammy have created for you. Martha and Tammy are patriots who love God and country. By purchasing the best beauty products, you may be turning back the clock on your appearance and supporting an American business with like-minded entrepreneurs. Check out their company at forever17.net. That's forever17.net today. Welcome to this week's News and Review. We are finding it more and more difficult each week to squeeze in all the news that occurs during the week, as our political opponents seem to be giving us an endless supply of things to talk about. So, bear with us as we try to hit these things rapid pace. This week's segment, I'm dubbing the whatever segment. On the health front, monkeypox is here. That's right, monkeypox. What the heck is that, you ask? Yeah, I didn't know either. But apparently it's similar to smallpox, and scientists estimate that it has a mortality rate of 1 in 10. There's only one case in the U.S., and there are a total of 80 cases in the world. Yeah, you heard that correctly. There's less than 100 cases worldwide, and yet words like outbreak are already being used. Remember last week's Kingdom Patriot news alert about the World Health Organization and the international health regulations? Well, Fox News is reporting that the WHO is meeting this week to discuss this disease. Remember, if we accept these regulations, then the WHO ultimately determines if this is a pandemic or not. Not good. Biden says we should be very concerned. Yeah, whatever. Cases are increasing in COVID again. However, I haven't heard a name for this new variant, if there's any. I haven't heard any kind of news that's gaining any traction, just that cases are increasing. Do we do this with the flu? Do we do this with other diseases? Do we call out the cases, or do we only talk about hospitalizations or death? I don't know. But it's time to panic, right, according to Biden? Yeah, whatever. On the corrupt political front, bombshell news, although at the same time not surprising, testimony from the Michael Sussman trial, you know, the attorney that helped the failed 2016 presidential campaign of Hillary Clinton. Yeah, at this trial, it sounds like via testimony that Hillary Clinton personally approved the spreading of false information to destroy Trump. That's not shocking to me, but what is shocking is that it was the defense's own witness that admitted this, and equally shocking is that it's actually making the news wires. Whatever. As reported in our alert last week, the WHO is looking to accept amendments to the IHR that would likely erode U.S. sovereignty when it comes to public health matters. Make sure you have contacted the White House and your senators and representatives today. I did mine already. The naysayers, this is all about nothing. I love the responses that I got from my representatives. Yeah, whatever. More to come, but it looks like in the back channels, it's an all-out political war against Elon Musk. Now, Elon Musk is saying he's voting Republican because the Democrats are the party of division and hate. Hey, Elon, welcome to the party. You're late, but better late than never. The left is vilifying him and this week removed Tesla's stock from an index that focuses on green energy. Okay, sure, it's not political. The world's leading electric car manufacturer is not green enough for your index. <laughs> Whatever. In the entertainment segment, Dinesh D'Souza's movie, 2000 Mules, continues to send shockwaves through the political establishment. I will be the first to tell you that this movie is not a guarantee of wrongdoing, but it only highlights the extensive smoke. And where there's smoke, there's always fire. Someone needs to investigate this and put teeth behind these allegations. Liberals say it's a bunch of nothing, just lies and innuendos. Yeah, whatever. We know better. Several Republican primaries occurred this week, but there's just too much news to discuss, so we'll leave that for another time. 
For this week's news and review, that's a wrap. Welcome back. I'd like to say hello to my co-host, Sean Griffin. Hey, Chris. How's it going? So this has got to be a little bit of a shock to you. Are you surprised that I'm advocating for violence? Yes, and not at all. (laughs) That's interesting. Well, that's because you know the rest of the story and you know the inside scoop. The truth is, you know that I like to sometimes bait our audience with our approach, and today that is no different. So we're going to get started by listening to this clip from Laverne Cox. And Laverne Cox was born in 1972 as a male and later decided to become a transgender woman, meaning he identifies as a female even though he is biologically a male. And I think as we listen to this clip, we'll get a better idea exactly what we mean that it's time for violence. I didn't want to exist. Some days I wake up and I am that black trans woman walking the streets of New York City, hearing people yell, that's a man. And I understand, I've come to understand that when a trans woman is called a man, that is an act of violence. Wow, that is just mind-blowing. It really is. You know, that clip is is almost eight years old, but I thought it had a lot of significance given the environment that we're in, given the momentum that we see the left taking. I thought it was particularly relevant today. When did words become violence? Yeah, I mean, wow. How the, the stuff that we've got to present today is mind-blowing, and we've been hearing it We've been witnessing it, but we probably haven't connected the dots. I know I didn't until two days ago. I would say that I'm in that same boat. I had not really connected the dots other than it was just like, okay, yeah, that's kind of crazy. And really, that's why we're tackling this today, because, uh uh-oh, we tackled the dots, and we need to let the audience know about these dots. Well, let's jump to an article, Sean, that is a little bit more recent. It's written at BigThink.com. It just dives into this particular issue as a whole, not just for transgender, but really the idea that words are violence. So I'm going to read some of this article and ask for your reaction. So in 1989, the novelist Salman Rushdie went into hiding. He went into hiding because the leader of Iran, the Ayatollah Khomeini, had issued a fatwa calling on valiant Muslims everywhere that they may be in the world to kill this writer without delay, for which the assassin would receive a bounty of a million dollars. What was Rusty's offense? Because he wrote a, a novel called The Satanic Verses, and the story depicted the Prophet Muhammad and his wives in ways that incensed most of the Muslim community and turned the author into the world's most infamous heretic. As the story circulated through international media, Western intellectuals often offered muddled responses. Now, of course, it was wrong for Khomeini to call for the murder of a novelist who had merely written a book. Most agreed, but few liberal-minded commentators seemed very eager to say that Rushdie was entirely without fault. The Indian-born writer had, after all, deeply offended the religious beliefs of millions of Muslims in nations where values like piety and respect for authority had long been deemed more important than free expression. So when you hear that, Sean, obviously his words were offensive— was the, was the Ayatollah Khomeini right in issuing for his execution? According to their belief system, yes, he was. According to everybody else's belief system, no, he wasn't. And therein lies the conflict. It is a conflict. And that's why I wanted to discuss this a little bit, was because this, is, this seems like an extremist response, but it is the response when you say that words are violence, this is the natural reaction to that. So let's continue in this article. When speech causes emotional or mental pain, the offended parties are morally entitled to nothing in the form of compensation from or punishment for the offender. So let's just kind of put that out there boldly. You do not have the right to not be offended. To be sure, that doesn't mean that deliberately offending people for its own sake is morally acceptable. You and I wouldn't argue that or that people should be entitled to use speech to incite violence or harass or threaten. But rather, it means that the impulse to punish people who offend is is a regressive urge, 
one that necessarily chips away at intellectual freedom, even if the punishers do not wield legal authority. Rausch outlined this reasoning. If the offenders cannot be put in jail, then they should lose their jobs. They should be subjected to organized campaigns of vilification, to be made to apologize, to be pressed to recant. If government cannot do the punishing, then private institutions and pressure groups through vigilantes, in effect, should do it. Sean, what's your reaction to that? <laughs> sounds like what's going on in today's world. It sounds pretty eerie, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah, it does. It's like they're not going to apply the same rules to uh, everybody else. So it's only going to be applied in certain places, and then they're free to live hypocrisy um, out on everything else. Yeah, absolutely. So Rausch continues, he described a problem that every society in human history has faced. How do groups of people best decide who is right? Every person, after all, is fallible, biased, and can only know so much. To answer the question, societies have followed a variety of principles that have helped them reach consensus and produce knowledge. Now, I'm not going to dive into all these five principles. I can tell you how to answer this without hesitation, without question. To decide what is right, we go to Scripture. We don't let man make a decision on what he thinks is right and wrong. We appeal to a higher authority. How do you feel about that? Totally. The other thing, another scripture that comes to mind is that he tells the believer that we are supposed to be slow to anger, so to speak. So getting offended is not a luxury. We're supposed to be slow to take offense and slow to anger. I really like that. That's absolutely uh, correct. So let, let's just continue. Three decades after the rest of the affair, you don't need to look for, very far for examples of offended people claiming to have been harmed by words. The only thing new about this phenomenon is the actual volume and and the, um, I shouldn't say just the volume, but the awareness, the frequency that occurs in our society. But if you look back over history, the Roman Catholic Church considered the idea of heliocentricity to be harmful in the 16th century. The same with evolution three centuries later. In the 1940s and 50s, the Second Red Scare deemed pro-communist writing and speech to be so dangerous to be the point of treason. The problem is whenever speech or ideas are categorized as violence, in effect akin to physical assault, an inevitable conclusion emerges. Something must be done. Is that what we're seeing today? Oh, yeah. Not evenly, but if one side... Uh, is not getting their way, then they are taking every route that they possibly can to extract revenge or make a change if they can't get their way. There was even uh, a modern day example where there was a conservative, uh, many referred to as right wing, speaking in 2017 at an event at UC Berkeley. And one of the professors there made this quote, asking people to maintain peaceful dialogue with those who legitimately do not think their lives matter is a violent act read one op-ed published in the Daily Californian. That's really important. They're saying, if this person doesn't value me, then that's a violent act. That seems extreme to me. That is. I mean, that's crazy. So this particular person, in her opinion piece, did raise some valid points about speech and ideas and how they cause damaging stress. But ultimately, the, so the so-called scientific policy of categorizing speech as violence yields the same prescription op uh, offered by so many people before her, which is what we just read, and that is cause in effect, something must be done. We must halt speech that bullies and torments, she concluded. From the perspective of our brain cells, the latter is literally a form of violence. But classifying speech as violence and treating as such pretends as if the harms caused by words and physical actions are equivalent. Despite fundamental differences between the two that even children understand, the classification demands that offenders be punished, leaving people with two options. Speak in ways that hurt people with words or in ways that don't. Mm. It was very obvious that the new disinformation board, which thankfully has been put on pause, uh, that's exactly what they were going to do. They're going to deem a bunch of different speech as violent or as uh, um, domestic terrorist type language and go after those people. Well, it turns out, or it's going to turn out, that most of that language is anything that counters what they believe or something that goes against their agenda. Yeah, so as you say that, it reminds me of that 
Wait, when it said you basically have two options, speak in ways that hurt people with words or in ways that don't, I think there's actually a third option that we see, and that is to not speak at all. That's actually the third option is it silences people to never speak up. And I'm just going to finish up this article, uh, this quote that Roush says, when we do become offended, as we all will, we must settle for responding with criticism or contempt, or in, I, in scripture, I would say, or with love and patience, and stop short of demanding that the offender be punished or required to make restitution. If you are unwilling to shoulder that obligation, if you insist on punishing people who say or believe hurtful things, as opposed to telling them why they are wrong or just ignoring them, then you cannot fairly expect to share in the peace, freedom, and probably solving process and success that liberal science is uniquely able to provide. Indeed, you are putting those very benefits at risk. Do you agree with that statement? That's, wow. I don't even know where to start. That's so crazy. I think they nail it. Nail it on the head. If you're in a society where you can't speak up because everything is a microaggression or an act of violence, then ultimately you're never allowing two groups to come together and actually have meaning, meaningful dialogue. So let's close out that for right now and go to a couple of other clips that I think are significant in our discussion today. President Biden's budget director. We think our language needs to be more inclusive. In the name of inclusion, activists are changing other words. Equality is now equity. Mistress is companion or lover. Affirmative action is diversity. And now speech can be violence. A transgender woman of color walking down the street and being called a man is an act of violence. One of the most pernicious things about the, the social justice control of language is this, this use of the word violence to describe language. Tim Sandifer of the Goldwater Institute. But the only way that we have as human beings to deal with one another is through language, through discussion, debate, deliberation. And if we say that that's a form of violence, then the only way left for us to relate to one another is through power. You're white. Why should anybody listen to you about this? Because what I say has or doesn't have merit on its own. One of the big problems with the social justice movement is the idea that people's mindset is controlled by their skin color. And that, although it may be called anti-racism in today's world, is just plain old, old-fashioned racism. Each other because we don't know what the words we're using mean. Linguist John McWhorter calls woke racism a new illogical religion that misleads. You learn that the idea is that where there are white and black disparities, we're supposed to call that phenomenon racism in the same way as Archie Bunker was racist. The country is going straight into the dumper. <laughs> and it never fully holds together to anybody who really keeps thinking about it. It's hard to keep up with what's okay and what's newly forbidden. For 10 years, a law professor's exam on employment discrimination included the N-word printed this way. But this year, a group of black students decided that they had been injured by seeing that on paper. One of them claimed that they had heart palpitations. I had to seek counsel immediately after the exam to calm myself. The reason they're doing it is not because they're bad people. They're doing it because claiming that kind of victimhood gives them a sense of belonging, a sense of togetherness. The students demanded the professor be punished, and he was. He's been suspended from teaching, all in the name of social justice. Wow, dude, that is so dangerous. I think it's unbelievably dangerous. So what, what has happened is mere words are being weaponized. Yeah. Anybody. I mean, on... on Oh my gosh, just the number of different levels that this could be used on and the number of different people that could be taken out if folks who are hearing the accusations are not wise to what is going on. Crazy. I thought it was particularly interesting, the comment that that people don't necessarily do this on purpose, but playing the role of victim allows them to identify with a group of people and have a sense of belonging. And I'm thinking to myself, what better way to say that I belong, to say that I've been a victim, than to say I have had a violent act committed against me? That was one of the takeaways that, that I heard. Well, and especially if you have an agenda, because think about it, rape victims— what keeps many of them from coming forward is what happened to them, the real violence, 
that happened to them. And they're so ashamed, even though they shouldn't be because they didn't perpetrate the crime. I think that's a really important point that that when we say that words are violence. Now, there are there are times when people say things that are just horribly rude, but there is a difference. Yes. E- even even hateful. But at the end of the day, in some ways, you dilute, you minimize, you delegitimize actual violent acts that cause significant physical, emotional harm. Yes. Next up, a clip from Lance Wallnow when we return. Hey, Sean Griffin here with the Kingdom Patriot Group and co-host of The Grid with Chris Kuhlman. Here at the Kingdom Patriot Group, we have a vision to restore America to her foundational principles. To help you do your part to restore the country, is there a particular topic we could cover that you would find helpful? If so, email us at admin at kingdompatriot.us. That's admin at kingdompatriot.us. We'd love to hear from you today. And we're back. You should not return violence with violence, but it is a it is a progressive ideology that is one that believes in violence. That was more of the point. I definitely think there's radicalized jo- Muslims. Jonathan is, is pointing his finger in the air. Yes, Jonathan, you have something to add to this? Well, I do. Yeah, exactly what you were talking about, Mercedes. And the, the issue is, is when you conflate words with violence. So that's really the point that we're at, is people are saying, your words are essentially violence against me, so I can retaliate with physical violence, because violence is violence, which is... And not how we're raised, not how we think, but that's how a lot of people on the left think. So, Wow. When you listen to that, it actually does make a sense. It may, at least it makes sense to me that if you, can, if you can call words violence, then now all of a sudden that does open the door for you to respond in kind. Is that how you see it? Dude, the moment that I heard Jonathan say this, the dots just connected. This is where the revelation hit because suddenly... All the things that I've been seeing, all the things that I've been hearing, not the clips that you've played today and the article that you've read, but suddenly, oh my gosh, everything makes sense. Then you can take all of these words that you don't like, all of the phrases that disagree or don't jive with your agenda, you can take them and basically put them into a clip and shove them into your verbal Uzi and just wipe people out. Yeah, I... As I listened to this, it started making a lot of sense that the conversation about January the 6th. Now, I think as Jonathan says that, my mind at first went to, oh, okay, I hate, say a hateful word to someone else. They call it violence. They turn around and they punch me in the face. I really don't think that that's where this is going. What I'm seeing is that's an act of violence. Therefore, we must legally be violent back. Yes. This is why you hear the call for people to go to prison. You hear the call for people to be silenced. You feel hear the call for people to be punished because of the words. I think that that's where this violent retribution, if you will, is going. Right. And for me, it didn't occur to me that that's how they were looking at the words, that those words are now justification for me to do something violent back to you or to do something really big. More when we return. You're listening to The Grid, brought to you by the Kingdom Patriot Group. We'll be right back. In order to expand our audience to like-minded believers and patriots, you have to tell them about us. How do you do that? I'm so glad you asked. Right now, in this moment, hit that follow button on your podcast and give us a five-star rating. Tell your friends and your neighbors about this community. Share any episode on your social media. If you feel compelled to share that photo of little Johnny who fell in a puddle, then surely sharing an episode of The Grid is just as easy. Help us today. Tell others about the Kingdom Patriot Group and this podcast, The Grid. And we're back. Dude, (laughs) what are we supposed to do with this? Well, I think that's a great question because as a conservative, but more importantly as a Christian, God does give us a roadmap in how we're to respond. So the first thing that I want to talk to is is about taming the tongue, Sean. I think God does call us to not be hypocrites in the way we talk and not, not to be angry, mean, vile people. And I think we can find that in James. And in James, it says the tongue is, is a world of fire. It's evil. It's, part, it's among the parts of the body. It corrupts the whole body, sets the whole course of one's life on fire, and itself set on fire by hell. And then this is important in verse 9. With the tongue, we praise our Lord and Father, and with it, we curse human beings who have been made in God's likeness. 
So I think that's really important to understand because, and to me, that is the roadmap. This is about how do we speak to people? Are we cursing fellow mankind at the same time we say that we love God? I, I, there is truth that we need, we need to behave in an appropriate manner. Would you agree? Oh, most assuredly. I think that as we address issues and we recognize that we are addressing an issue, it's kind of like you're at the office uh, and an issue comes up. You, it might be in private, but you need to speak as though several different people could be listening. And you have to be careful with your words. Uh, but the thing that, that strikes me, there's three things. One, speak the truth. Number two, speak it in love. And then three, speak it purposefully, as in you are believing the Lord for the truth spoken in love to actually land and have an effect. And then bonus, pray for them. So that was actually number four or number three A. And Sean, you took the words right out of my mouth. If we go to Ephesians 4.15, we see that Paul wrote, instead, speaking the truth in love, we will grow to become, in every respect, the mature body of him who is the head, that is Christ. What I feel like this movement is designed to do, it is to equate truth, if it's not the other person's truth, as an act of violence, therefore you're devoid of love, and the only way that you are required to respond is to not respond at all. That you must accept, you must not call out, you must be silent. And I think scripture, boy, if I take these two scriptures and look at them closely, what I'm reading the Lord say is that don't curse other people, but you must speak the truth in love. There is a right way and a wrong way to speak truth, but I see nowhere in scripture where we're told to be silent with the truth. How do you respond to that? Yeah. Our responsibility is to speak the truth. Scripture tells us to be ready in season and out of season to explain our faith. And in this case, our faith, our faith is being tested by these many issues. But that's where people need to hear the truth the most. Sean, that's about all the time we have today. Final thoughts. Wow, man, I'm really glad that we did this. We, it is important for believers and patriots to understand that there's a large segment of the population under the influence of a small segment of the population that wants to turn our words into weapons by labeling them as violent. Yeah, I totally agree. I think that as we approach this, we have to remember that this movement, by and large, is void of God, in which people have made their own thoughts, their own feelings, their own identity as their own God, and they're expecting everyone else to accept that. And I think the Lord is clear that we need to be careful with our tongue. We don't need to curse those people. We don't need to be angry with those folks. We need to be slow to anger. But we also have to speak the truth. And speaking the truth in love is not easy when we have our own emotions. So folks, I would just implore you, be reminded that it's the Holy Spirit that helps us tame the tongue. It's also the Holy Spirit that helps us speak the truth in love, even when it's difficult. Until next time, I'm Chris Coleman. And I'm Sean Griffin. And, and we, we are Kingdom, Kingdom Patriots. Patriots. And thanks again to our sponsor, Forever 17. Visit www.forever17.net to get your Turn Back the Clock beauty elixirs today, and you will be supporting Martha and Tammy. Don't forget to visit our website at kingdompatriot.us to join the movement of faith and freedom. That's kingdompatriot.us. Join today so that together we can make a difference. Your membership is appreciated. Your input is valued. Your voice is needed. I'm Chris Coleman, and I am a Kingdom Patriot. 